Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank peoples. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation with Francesca Morgan about her new book, A Nation of Descendants, which looks at how genealogy has been used by specific groups and how its use has changed over time. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two programs you can view later this month on our YouTube channel. On Friday, October 22nd at noon, NASA astronaut Nicole Stott will discuss her work on the International Space Station and share insights from scientists, activists, and changemakers who are working to solve our greatest environmental challenges. Her new book is Back to Earth. And on Wednesday, October 27th at 1 p.m., Nathaniel Philbrick will discuss Travels with George, his new book that recounts his own modern day journey based on George Washington's presidential excursions. In the late 1970s, National Archives research rooms saw a surge in new researchers inspired by Alex Haley's book and television show Roots. They searched for their own family links, not necessarily to find an illustrious ancestor, but to discover where they came from and to understand their place in history. Those who come to the National Archives to search for family connections usually start with census records, which show us individuals, families, and neighborhoods. Pinpointing a specific line on the form identifies a person, and looking at the whole page and its surrounding pages gives a snapshot of the community in which they lived. In less than six months, on April 1st, 2022, we'll open the 1950 census and get a look at another historical slice of America. Censuses may be the entry point, but the National Archives researchers also sift through records documenting immigration and naturalization, military and civilian service, bankruptcies, taxation, schools, and much more. Many of these records are available online at the National Archives website and through our digital partners. And as any researcher can tell you, being able to make a personal connection to one of the millions of stories contained in these records is a feeling like no other. Francesca Morgan is Associate Professor of History at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago and author of Women and Patriotism in Jim Crow America. Her research interests include the history of genealogy in the United States since 1800. Joining Francesca Morgan in conversation is Karen Wolfe, who is historian of 18th century British America. Her research focuses on gender, family, and political culture. Her latest book, Lineage, Genealogy and the Power of Connection in British America, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Now let's hear from Francesca Morgan and Karen Wolfe. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. Thank you all so much for being with us and thank you to the National Archives and to the Archivist for that very warm welcome. Um, Francesca, it is wonderful to be in conversation with you. We have talked about your research over years and it's delightful to see this marvelous book actually and to hold it and to read it. So congratulations to you, first of all. Thank you, I it's thought, good to see you too. <laughs> I thought we would just start with uh, talking a little bit about genealogy itself. That is, what is genealogy and why is it so popular? And tell us a little bit about genealogy's popularity, and then we'll dig into some of the themes of the book. All right. Well, um, to make a long story short, we would answer this question differently depending on where we are in history and what culture we're in. But I can say with confidence that in modern times, uh, genealogy in many ways is a interstate highway leading to history. It's for people who just love explorations of the past, but it also speaks volumes about our present, our identities in, as individuals. And of course, in my book, I get very involved with uh, genealogies, meanings for all sorts of group boundaries and um, uh, group sorting uh, and all these different things. I'm going to keep my answer short because I want to allow time for as many questions as I can. Karen, I can spend the rest of the hour <laughs> on your question, but I think I'm going to look it there. I, I hear you. I hear you. Well, it is phenomenal, really, the popularity of genealogy, even if we just think about the space that it has taken up in libraries, if we think about the volume of publications devoted to genealogy, if we think about 
the space on the internet or in the world of entertainment now that genealogy is occupying. It's really an extraordinary phenomenon. Um, and I think, you know, your book talks, though, about not just genealogy's popularity or how it is for Americans today, but about the history of genealogy. So tell us a little bit about how genealogy actually has a history. That is, it's not just a practice that is kind of obvious and that people just set out and do, but that it actually has its own history. Tell us a little bit about that. You're so right. The modern day popularity of uh, genealogy, including online, is very characteristic of our historical moment. And what can, uh, what can I say? It's a very, very, very old habit. And as you noticed, a, um, a worldwide habit, if you will, um, in uh, nations and civilizations of all that you can think of. It takes a lot it takes a big effort not to see all the ways genealogy operated in the past or to have an impression of it. You know, you can point to medieval Europe, you can point to Confucianism in China, all sorts of things. And I can say more about the past and the present in the United States, um, mm -hmm. if you want me to. But in the meantime, I'm going to uh, go on to your next question. You can always go back and go further in depth on any of these points. So one of the things that you say in your book is that not only does genealogy have a history that we can explore through the history of genealogical institutions or genealogical um, kind of cultural phenomena, but you also say that there is a political dimension to genealogy. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by the politics of genealogy? I mean, it's right there in your yes. title, politics, right yes. there, nation of descendants, politics and the practice of genealogy in US history. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Right, well, I define the word politics very broadly, not just the working of governmental institutions. I have a lot about laws and so forth, uh, uh, depending on genealogy record keeping in chapter one, but politics also means very broadly, the workings of power. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about social hierarchies of all kinds, as well as challenges to all sorts of social hierarchies. I'm thinking very broadly, race, class, gender, particular, religious minorities, particular, um, ethnic groups, and I could go just um, on and on. But yes, um, I'm especially interested in genealogy, as I said, as a, a sort of a, all the ways that it keeps and weakens group boundaries and all the ways that it seals hierarchies of all sorts. Um, socially. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so if genealogy has a history and there is a kind of political dimension to that history, um, in the United States, which is the, the focus of your book, um, let's talk a little bit about, um, how American genealogy is. That is that what is this specifically Americanness in your book? Um, if genealogy is a practice that across time and space, it's there aren't a lot of things that historians like to think about as transhistorical, but genealogical practice seems to be one of them. But yeah. what is it that's so American about what you've captured here about this modern history of genealogy? Absolutely. The things that are character characteristically American about genealogy practice in the U.S. Uh, going way back is that... Um, all the ways that it reconstituted social social hierarchies in the wake of the American Revolution, where we supposedly supposedly uh, did away uh, with hereditary forms of government. Uh, think about aristocrats. Think about monarchs inheriting uh, their positions. Supposedly, we did away with all of that. But there's a whole. Uh, number of ways that um, authority is replaced, especially in everyday social life. And so I noticed another one of your questions was about um, genealogy cultures in uh, republics that don't have, um, you know, aristocrats right there with their family mm -hmm. crests. Mm -hmm. um, and that really flows into the question of genealogy in the United States. And another thing I want to say about distinctively American forms of genealogy is that this country has been a world leader in what I'm going to call genealogy for profit, mm -hmm. genealogy uh, businesses, uh, genealogy as a vocation, as a career, um, 
as a hobby and uh, especially in the last 30 years, uh, this new, relatively new and recent form of mass genealogy commerce mm -hmm. um, and a genealogy as entertainment mm -hmm. not on screen and also everything that tourists do when they're on route mm -hmm. trips, uh, not to mention all the ways this appears on your reality show. All of mm -hmm. that is, um, it's, it's, it's so American. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, can, I can go on from there. Oh, another thing that I think I can say is characteristically American is um, as genealogy businesses and commercialized uh, forms of genealogy go from small to big, from you know corner over here to, to mass, uh, we have an anti-commercial backlash of sorts that takes the form of scholarly genealogy. And that's still around today. Another word for that genre within genealogy practice is professional. I tend to use the word professional uh, mm -hmm. for them. It isn't mm -hmm. just career genealogists, but there really is a sense of a professional guild and something that must be taught and adherence mm -hmm. to primary documents. You might think what's anti-commercial about that? Well, mm -hmm. um, we, uh, as we say among historians, are we doing the past for its own sake? Are we trying to foster empathy with the very different ways of thinking in the past? Or are we looking at the past uh, in a way that will serve the present? Are we finding congenial values in the past of the sort that we want to reinforce uh, in the present day, all the ways that interpretations of the past can serve the present. So anyhow, with professionals, we find history for its own sake uh, among business people because their clients is the descendant. Certainly, uh, we find many instances of um, sort of studies of the past deployed to serve the needs of the present. And I would dare say the market. Um, again, I'm seeing... Um, meanings of America all over that, both things. Yeah, that's so interesting. Let me go back and ask you to pick up one of those threads. Um, you say you say in the book that, um, you know, there is this kind of notion of the American character forged in the revolution, anti-monarchical. The American revolution is the triumph of individualism um, over hereditary government. So it is, you know, the American patriots against King George and the monarchy. And the notion is that Americans have a kind of spirit and ethic of individualism and that it matters who you are individually and not where you come from, not yes. what your family background is. And you say in the book that it's striking that not just in the United States, but elsewhere, the genealogy seems to be most robust, not in countries or societies where heredity still really matters governmentally, but in republics and democracies. So can you talk about that a little bit? That seems really contradictory. Why would there be so much investment in hereditary background in places where, you know, the democratic ethos suggests that it matters, the individual is what matters, not the family background? One would think, but my um, two second, my shorter answer to your very rich question is to say once again, in republics and uh, democracies that have experienced uh, that kind of revolution, and we can apply this all over North America anyway, um, I think it's safe to say that in the absence of hereditary government, group hierarchies of all sorts get reinscribed. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to tell you or my audience um, all the ways that some of these hierarchies, and this is kind of different, are thought of in a hereditary way, race, is something said mm -hmm. to be inherited, uh, mm -hmm. for example. So uh, you look around in these republics and you find all of these other institutions in both government and outside government that reinscribe heredity. Uh, another thing from US history, enslavement, slavery, mm -hmm. that's hereditary through the mother mm -hmm. in a country where supposedly, uh, the, well, Thomas Jefferson said the dead have no rights to Tocqueville remarked on all the ways Democrats sever themselves uh, from the past, although he's contradictory on this point. Um, yeah, I could, I could go on, but that's a really good question and I can answer it for later times. Okay, so so let me, um, let me press you on another, um, and we will absolutely are going to come back to the question about slavery and race and how that plays a role in the history and politics of genealogy. 
Um, but let me press you on another very American dimension, which is Latter-day Saints and the importance of Latter-day Saints and the Mormon church in fostering not just genealogical um, consciousness and practice, but also genealogical institutions. Can yeah. you talk about that a little bit too? Because that's a very American phenomenon Absolutely. that then has a very global impact. Made in the USA, but since 1996, there have been more Latter-day Saints outside the United States than inside American uh, export, if you will, in mm -hmm. so many ways. All right, yes, uh, to answer your question, um, within this realm that I just described of uh, the American Republic where social differences get reinscribed, Within the history of Mormonism, very, very early, literally starting with Joseph Smith, uh, the founder of the religion and the church, um, there's this um, spiritual, or I would say virtual form of outreach to the dead um, to garner more souls. As, as a, a worshiper, you have to show that you've done this outreach for the dead. The church does not claim to, uh, what's the word, doesn't claim knowledge about uh, whether the dead person responds and uh, to and accepts baptism or not, but anyhow, you have there's this basic obligation in the course of worship, this basic temporal ceremony where you fill this um, obligation to evangelize the dead, and this importance of reaching out to the dead to your fate in the afterlife is a has been a tremendous motivating character. Uh, uh, tremendous motivation um, and uh, grows your numbers and grows your commitment to institutions um, within the church, uh, co institutional commitments towards record keeping. And I'm talking about the massive index card file that became that massive um, cave full of microfilm negatives. And nowadays, massive digital holdings on familysearch.org. We pass mm -hmm. through the generations, we see a change in scale, but it really builds on a very old tendency. And I would add that when we take even a casual look at the business history of genealogy, every time we see, not every time, but every time since 1945, where we've seen a bigger business than before, we can point to founders of a business and you know, a lot of the people who patronize the business as having Latter-day Saints roots or some kind of affiliation. Ancestry Inc., which later became mm -hmm. Ancestry.com, was started in the early 80s, 1980s, by um, two, uh, you know, a couple of young uh, recent graduates of Brigham Young University, which is the church's uh, university. Um, so, yeah, both in and outside uh, the church, including in private life where there are businesses, we see that. Mm -hmm. So important. Let me just ask you to um, expand even a little bit more on that because the influence of the Latter-day Saints, I think, is so um, is so significant. And for, for anybody who is doing genealogical research online, which is how most people are encountering yes. that research now, whether it's family search or ancestry.com, they're influenced by those, you know, that century plus of genealogical record keeping and research um, and aggregation. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, um, um, you talked about Joseph Smith and his first vision and, and how, that, how that influenced um, ideas about baptism of the dead and baptizing ancestors into, uh, into the church. But also Wilford Woodruff is so important in the later 19th century and really comes into the story in a powerful way that you tell about the influence um, of Mormonism and American genealogy. Okay, just to modify something very quickly, what you said, if there are experts uh, on, and, or people deep, deeply knowledgeable of Latter-day Saints out there, uh, this was not in the first vision in particular, this was in... Mm -hmm. um, safe to say, the second or third or very early mm -hmm. vision with the, um, the uh, uh, sorry, angelic uh, uh, visit and in, in the talk of the dead, his dead brother. Okay, um, sorry uh, to uh, cut to the chase here on the rest of the question. Wilford Woodruff, I remind yeah. you, was uh, president of the church in the 1890s after decades and decades of a you know, being a missionary and so many other things to say, uh, being church president and within the Church of the Lab of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is like being a pope. Um, you know, it's a quite a hierarchical um, 
priesthood uh, set up uh, mm-hmm. within the church. And this bears on what I'm going to say next. It's with his presidency that the church begins its commitment to genealogy institutions um, focusing on amassing um, information about earthly uh, relations. Um, we, we see a new explicit talk of um, getting your uh, relations to your living and dead relatives who are family to you sealed. That becomes explicit. Why does it become explicit in the 1890s? It's because it's when the church uh, ceases its practice of spiritual adoption. I'm happy to say there's some new work coming out. Megan Stanton, if you're out there, I'm giving you a shout on the uh, church's practices of spiritual adoptions, which I can talk about more. But as um, the adoptions cease uh, to grow, uh, the church uh, stops its practice. It turns to this much more explicit talk of sealing yourself uh, to the uh, biological, we might say, the the, the blood relatives uh, that that you have. Um, and there's some wonderful quotations from Woodruff. So Woodruff, uh, his presidency marks the turning point where uh, we start to see the very first array of genealogy, genealogy institutions and instruction and genealogy columns in the Latter-day Saints uh, newspaper, the Deseret uh, News, um, and it goes on from there. Lots to say about these different stages in the 20th century. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about something you raised earlier, just briefly, which is about uh, the significance of uh, race and of the institutions of slavery in particular, and how that's played a role in American genealogical thinking. And I know these are actually separate, one can hold these, these concepts separately, that is slavery and what the, what the institution of slavery did to later practiced for or against later practices of genealogical research, and also American ideas about race, which seem to pervade genealogy, as, yes. you, as you argue in the book, um, and as you show, um, whether we're talking about African Americans or other um, other groups, ideas about race just seem to pervade American genealogical practice. So, you, can you talk about both of those, both slavery Absolutely. and and race? I'll be as brief as I can, uh, but it's safe to say I could re- easily take the rest of the hour on the mm, first question. So important. <laughs> These are deep and profound questions. Right. Absolutely. To preview uh, what I say in the book about uh, and the descendants of enslaved people um, doing genealogy, there are particular ways that enslavement, uh, what am I trying to say, suppressed uh, record keeping and all these other things that genealogists depend on to trace individual and family identities. There are these just these particular gross violations of Victorian uh, 19th century norms of uh, kinship to talk about. I remind you that slavery um, and uh, traced inheritance through the mother, if your mother was enslaved, uh, you were too, and removed all, uh, okay, what word am I looking for? Responsibility and kinship from the biological father and that feature alone incentivized, uh, or it literally it, it um, created a situation where it paid every time and it's uh, it paid the owner every time an enslaved woman got pregnant Mm -hmm. and there's a lot to say there okay Mm -hmm. so um i'm just going to leave the what i say about enslavement there's a lot more to say uh that uh modern day um uh people who research african-american ancestry often portray the 1870 uh, u.s census as the brick wall Mm. They use that expression, the brick wall, because before mm. that, in, uh, you know, sorry, the 1870 federal census is the first one taken after uh, slavery was outlawed in, in 1865. Mm. And before 1870, the federal census has listed enslaved people. Mm. I think that there was, dear me, um, it's been a while since so I looked at this material, but it's yeah. uh, basically, uh, maybe we get as specific as their ages. Uh, yeah. Their yeah, numbers, yeah. their gender, but never names. Yeah. And you depend yeah. on names when you do genealogy research. Okay, um, about race, um, idea, re- ideas about race. Uh, 
to make a long story short, you look for, um, there are these characteristics where race is inherited. Race depends on uh, documentation. And so indeed, there are all these ways that um, starting in the late 19th century, and I would say extending very well into nowadays, um, genealogy gets deployed to reinforce uh, and, and enforce racial boundaries. We see that with uh, Jim Crow in the South and all the cruelties that happen to African-Americans once uh, enslavement is outlawed, once slavery is outlawed. Uh, we see this obviously in Indian country um, with all the forms that colonization takes. Um, and again, uh, this is just a little preview of the book. Um, but there's uh, genealogy practice in itself is not racial on its face. And there's a very strong kinship all through the 20th century, all through the different phases of the civil rights movement, where we see civil rights activists, including really pivotal figures like W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, taking up uh, genealogy along with history. And it really is a profound uh, form of resistance against white supremacy for in the end uh, for an African-American to uh, trace their black ancestry and their white ancestry too, or to some of them uh, uh, back, mm -hmm. right? So, um, okay, there's a lot more to say that I see in my book about race and race uh, features in all the chapters. It's really complicated because it seems like you're, you know, you're often talking about what individuals are doing to explore their own family background, but you're also talking about broad patterns mm -hmm. and also institutions and organizations that have particular commitments. I mean, you use the phrase white supremacy to talk about how genealogy is, is functioning, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th century. So can you just address that a little bit? Like what is what are some of the organizations that you would say are actually in that period using genealogy to advance white supremacy? That's right. Well, I can point to particular laws, but in the interest of time, the groups that I most have in mind uh, for the late 19th century um, that are really signify uh, these broader developments are the emergence of those daughters and dames and sons and uh, hereditary groups in general in the late 19th century. In the genealogy mm -hmm. community, they often refer to these groups as patriotic groups mm -hmm. or hereditary groups. And of course, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot to say about the relationship between uh, genealogy activity and patriotism. But mm -hmm. why do these groups, what do these groups have to do with white supremacy? Well, nowadays, things are very different with them. Um, they're mm -hmm. making serious commitments to expanding uh, mm -hmm. commemoration in particular of mm -hmm. um, black and brown people and diversifying within themselves or they're starting that process. So it's a lot to say, but when they first emerge, um, they truly uh, exist as a way to certify whiteness in part because the features of genealogy at that time so dependent on documentation and the whole act of documenting your ancestors and finding them in the archive ex depends on all sorts of class and race privileges both for your ancestor and yourself. Um, and a uh, hundred years ago, much more than now, the kinds of uh, sort of documents that archives and historical societies collected were much more about, I would say, white people and uh, the, the elite. Um, when I say white, by the way, that's a sliding concept. Uh, I'm talking about a time period a hundred years ago where the term white meant a particular kind of European, the people that nowadays we might refer to as wasps uh, in my uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, in my book, I make reference to them as white Anglo-Americans. It takes a while mm -hmm. for, and I thank you, Nell Painter, for writing the history of white people. It takes mm -hmm. a while for European descent to equal white. Mm -hmm. so that's a sliding concept. All right, but yes, Karen, um, uh, those institutions I would really uh, start off and pointing to are these um, hereditary groups that um, emerge in the Gilded Age. They emerge in the 1890s and 1900s and the 19, you know, sort of 19 teens as well. And they don't go away. Uh, they, they, they keep growing uh, and they're dynamic. Uh, they keep changing. And so yes, to refer to the original question of the American Revolution, why, what is it about these adults that build being a daughter or a son um, or a dame 
uh, into their uh, social identity. Um, I thought we weren't supposed to care about the past and breaking forward as revolutionaries and, of course, lighting up for the territory in the case of the American West. Okay, I could go on and on, but I will uh, be glad to handle your next question. Well, I think that what's helpful about um, what you what you set out there in terms of some of these hereditary societies like the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Sons of the American Revolution, Colonial Dames, and so on, that in their late 19th century iteration, that kind of emphasis on whiteness and white heredity, um, that helps explain why folks like Du Bois would articulate genealogy as a kind of resistance activity. Yes. Um, a kind of a resistance both to the decimation of knowledge about African-American families um, in the period, uh, the long period of slavery, and also as a resistance to the kind of um, uh, kind of ideas about race and family and belonging yes. that is being put forward by these organizations. So I think that's a really helpful context there for us to see genealogy as a, as a kind of resistance activity, reclaiming yes. family connections. And that that sort of leads me to my next question about um, something the archivist referred to, which is the 1970s, what we think of as the kind of roots phenomenon. Um, first of all, can you talk a little bit about what is the roots phenomenon? And then I have a very specific question for okay. you to follow up about that. So let's talk a little bit about Alex Haley's roots, what it was and kind of what it meant okay. to genealogy in America. Right, um, Roots was Alex Haley's best-selling uh, book he called it a saga. Uh, and uh, with and a few months after the book was published, it was a miniseries. It was an eight night uh, TV show. And um, both uh, the book and the TV show were about the previous seven generations of Alex Haley's ancestry. He claimed uh, to uh, both name and know the full story of his enslaved ancestor, Kunti Kinte, who was originally kidnapped uh, from uh, West Africa out of the Mandinka tribe, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And uh, so that was uh, Haley's claim. And um, the story goes all through Kunti Kinte's descendants, particular enslaved people, and also emancipated people. Um, uh, blacksmith, uh, uh, Tom Murray, uh, that's a very high status and uh, skilled job. And so you have these, among other things, black businessmen like this in the story, Chicken George. Okay, I can name names. Um, it's it's a quite, the 1970s too. version is quite melodramatic and it's a fine show. And I understand in the History Channel, there's a reboot uh, from 2016. One thing Roots uh, uh, imparted to its audiences is a very explicit uh, portrayal of the middle passage of the uh, slave ship, uh, the the dying and the gross uh, atrocities taking place aboard slave ships. And this is on network television um, at a time when, uh, like I say, these portrayals of um, Africans as well as African-Americans as main characters driving the story um, are just very, very rare. Very, very rare. So, um, okay, what did Roots do for the history of genealogy? Um, the reason why Roots uh, found this un unanticipated popularity and surprised network executives had a hard time believing that this audience, this TV audience that was majority white at the time would watch uh, Roots in such numbers and generate such ratings. Roots built on uh, trends that were already there and exploded them afterwards, wherein we have warts in all genealogy, like um, uh, you all pointed out uh, in the intro. Um, we're at a point in time uh, after 1945, well, it's like a big slow trend, where um, your ancestors, are you and you embrace them and you want to know more about them because they're part of you and it, you have a come as you are attitude towards your ancestors. You don't sort of filter among them to find the successful ones or the ones that most appeal to you. Um, and the reason why I call it warts and all is that um, I encountered a, a woman in the 1970s who started this group about the gangster uh, family and I had thought maybe it's a surname because I've seen all sorts of surnames, you know. No, um, she wanted to reach out to other people with what she called criminals in their family tree to kind of foster research on them. You know, she wasn't ashamed of the ancestor she called a gangster. 
Mm-hmm. She wanted to magnify the knowledge. Of course, this is the time where the Godfather movies are out and uh, Bonnie and Clyde and everything like this. I could go on and on, but that's the moment we're talking about. And has everything to do with the beginnings of social history, of the sort of histories being done of um, immigrants and working people and people of color and uh, women of all sorts. You are doing social history even when you're looking at very elite and uh, very well-advantaged women. Um, this period is a very fertile one for that. And it, that's definitely the value of the genealogy boom. There's a real commitment to finding your female ancestor, even your maternal lineage, which can be a real job, uh, to this day, even when we're talking about white families that leave a lot of records, um, uh, everything to do with, um, immigrants, uh, looking up their roots and uh, trying to throw off this expectation of conforming wasp culture that was so characteristic in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Um, I could go on. So the roots moment, it begins and inspires roots. I would say Haley's, all the work that Alex Haley did in terms of writing roots was itself uh, expressive of the roots Mm -hmm. phenomenon. But afterwards Mm -hmm. we see an increase in scale uh, and we see a qualitative increase, uh, institution building among more and more groups. Um, I have a, an extensive uh, history in my book of all the building of institutions dedicated to American Jewish uh, genealogy emerging right after Roots, with Roots being cited in the founding statements of the first ever Jewish genealogical society in the United States and New Jersey. And now this is all over the world, you know, they're they're in Moscow, they're in, uh, even in uh, Germany. We have Jewish genealogical societies, and that's another American export. Um, I have lots to say about the first ever, uh, the, the, Af- these, the first time African-American genealogists come together in uh, organizations uh, with chapters, the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society and its journal. Uh, There's a lot to say. It uh, comes uh, about in the 1970s and 80s, and it's still going, of course. There's lots of manuals and things and lots of energy surrounding this very difficult field of genealogy. And a lot of that institutional expression comes after roots. First ever Hispanic uh, slash Latinx genealogy conferences uh, happened in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, no doubt inspired by Roots to turn it into an institution. I see it in Texas, uh, in particular, Austin area. We have some very active, um, uh, well, they self-identify as Hispanic uh, genealogists at that time. So I could go on and on, Irish American, Polish American, ethnic minorities of all sorts, you name it. And I say minority because at that time, it's more debatable nowadays whether these groups truly, you know, we, we should use the word minority anymore, but I think it's fair to use it for the 1970s. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that that roots moment that you describe um, it, as both a cumulus, accumulation of some phenomena and also then um, producing an explosion of new phenomenon. Really, really interesting to see roots as pivotal, not just as kind of um, entirely fresh and new. And one thing I I wanted to ask you about, which was really wonderful to read in your book, is about the um, remarkable lawyer, civil rights activist, Polly Murray, and her book, Proud Shoes, um, where she writes in a very different vein from Haley about her family and about her family background, her African descended family, and also native descended family. Um, so I wanted to ask you about Polly Murray's Proud Shoes and how we might think of that as a kind of forerunner to Roots and the Roots phenomenon. I love to talk about that. Uh, Polly Murray is known for many things. And to make a long story short, she published Proud Shoes 20 years uh, before Roots um, with a uh, commercial press. Um, and the reason why I consider this particular work of hers, among all the other things that she did, um, the reason I consider this work so important in the history of the Roots ethos is that um, she was, uh, you know, mixed race uh, growing up as African American, and um, you know, lots of civil rights activism to talk about for both her and the aunts, the three aunts, three aunts uh, that raised her, and so this is a family history of her mother's side um, going back generations into enslavement and um, a painful story that's all too common of the white biological father who is also the master 
uh, the slave owner uh, mm. of her grandmother, and this is all in uh, North Carolina, in the area around Chapel Hill. Why do I see this as anticipating roots? It's because both Polly Murray and later on Alex Haley um, uh, reached back to research multiracial family trees. And of course, we're at a point in American history where um, a mixed race person who has black ancestry tends to grow up as African American with the rest of the society identifying them as African American. So I know it's a complicated question, but anyhow, with both of them, we find family trees made up of people of different races, um, African American and white and indigenous uh, in, in, in many ways. And um, you know, her book also had very, uh, I would say explicit presentations of um, slavery's, atro both slavery's atrocities and all the ways that people survived and um, built themselves up. Um, her, um, well, Polly Murray's grandfather was a uh, Civil War veteran, um, I believe having come from a free black background, but you, uh, she has a lot to say about the um, African-American uh, soldier who fought for the Union in the American uh, Civil War. Okay, um, I'm getting off on a, on a tangent here, I must say. But I think a Polly Murray tangent is always a good tangent. <laughs> well, well, absolutely. Um, there's a new documentary on her that I haven't had a chance to watch yet. But what I want to just say about uh, Polly Murray's importance in my own book is that I wanted to set down proud shoes in the history of genealogy. It, it, it uh, deserves a place. She was ambivalent about whether to sort of call herself a genealogist. And she kind of moved on to other things because she had all those different careers. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, there she is again, uh, commenting on her proud shoes in retrospect when Roots uh, came out. And so um, the, she's part of a broader picture of the research I do on African-Americans doing genealogy before Roots. Mm -hmm. This is a place to bring in intersectional theory if you're interested in that, mm -hmm. and that we, we don't have to look too closely to see that these are people in the black middle class, typically mm -hmm. highly educated who do this, mm -hmm. but be that as it may when they you know, step into the street, uh, they're, they're black in America, and there's a lot to say. So anyhow, I wanted to set down Polly Murray and uh, all the ways that the roots uh, sort of ethos developed to inspire and fuel roots. So um, another thing that I think is interesting about um, uh, you're situating Polly Murray's proud shoes there. I mean, it, it makes one think of so many things of different ways that people think about lineages and the way that she is thinking about, um, you know, the lineages of her mother's sisters. Um, and she's thinking about that in um, what Martha Jones, historian Martha Jones would call the vanguard, um, generations of black women activists. Um, and Polly Murray is kind of, you know, setting down that sense of inheritance um, from those women, really interesting. But I also think it addresses something else that you talk about in the book, which is the question of um, chosen families and about how the new science of genetics and DNA, which claims a kind of certainty about family connections. Um, whereas if in the 19th and the early 20th century, the mid 20th century, it was genealogical records that created a sense of certainty about descent. Now it's DNA that offers a kind of veil of certainty around relationships, just at the moment where we understand better how just how complex families are, how chosen families are, whether adoptive families, um, LGBTQ families, mm -hmm. um, chosen kin. Um, in other words, is it an, do you think this is asking you outside of the book, but do you think there's a moment here where DNA comes along to say this is all certain at the same moment when there's a lot of uncertainty around the fixity of biology and its relationship to families? That's a great insight. And I wish I made it more explicit in my final chapters. I think you're really uh, hitting on a whole uh, array of things that I uh, talk about. I think that, um, okay, there's a lot to say about how DNA testing that is genealogy focused gets marketed. And I think, uh, or I know it got marketed successfully, uh, especially among people who are sort of taking refuge from how fluid uh, the family 
seem to become in the 1990s. There's a, and earlier times too, obviously there's a really fraught, I would say political uh, set of arguments that truly happens uh, between the political parties and surrounding the religious right. Our families, those families with two heterosexual parents and children, um, or it can, you know, a, a pair of adults that might even be ex, uh, access to each other or not just declare themselves a family, you know. Mm -hmm. So at the point where the family becomes more fluid, I think it's expressive of a broader cultural divide, uh, if you will. And but this turns really complicated when you turn to real people. You can uh, people contain many multitudes, and you could find the same person living as a member of a found family who is also researching their DNA uh, mm -hmm. for some other reason. Sure. Um, and another thing I want to say about uh, another thing you pointed to and the emergence of the DNA testing clearly, and here I'm standing in the shoulder of sociologists and others who have done research and the question I'm about to say, there's no doubt that the way DNA test results that are done for genealogy purposes get interpreted currently, mm -hmm. it reinscribes all these social differences that I spent my book talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. It reinscribes racial and ethnic differences. Well, if you I don't know if you uh, look at even give the most basic look to what geneticists are saying and others uh, in the wake of the uh, first genome being fully uh, understood. Uh, on the other hand, the genetic science itself makes nonsense of really of all the ways that humans are distinct from mice, let alone all these differences uh, among humans. It's, a, it's sort of an astonishing uh, moment uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the persuasion uh, exhibited by uh, marketers and, and many, many IMEs here. But there's a reason well, why I have the found families, of, you know, the, the people who the chosen families mm -hmm. and that can get interpreted yeah. very, very broadly. Um, that's especially noticeable uh, for LGBTQ uh, parents and people who identify as, as uh, queer, mm -hmm. gender queer. Mm -hmm. It's a queer practice mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. go online at like uh, someone I know and um, uh, adopt someone online and declare yourself a family. You know, what a moment and how disruptive it is for the old time Victorian family norms that are still cherished by many other people, not to mention inscribed into law. Uh, still in many parts of the United States, all the ways that state constitutions have redefined marriage to be but between a man and a woman before the Supreme Court decision. And I dare say backlash against uh, Obergefell 2015. You, uh, you can look it up. Uh, I can elaborate more on that. I know I opened a can of worms, but uh, go ahead. Well, let me ask you to just back up just a minute. And uh, let's just talk a little bit about what DNA um, and what role DNA actually is playing in genealogy. Um, let's just back up a little bit to say, uh, just to find some of that a little bit. So when is it that um, DNA science actually comes into the mainstream of genealogy research and really comes to play a role? And what role is it playing in, geneal in genealogical research now? That's a great question. It's that when we talk about sort of the broader uses of genealogical testing, the decade is the 2000s going up to the present the years since 1999. That's when we see it really marketed towards genealogists. And um, there are many meanings to talk about for communities of genealogists, but the one that I'm especially interested in is that um, if you're talking, if, if you have ancestors who are hard to document for whatever reason, we had a question uh, from someone with adoption, for uh, sort of closed adoption in, the, in their family tree, for example, uh, but you have some situation in your genealogy research where documentation is difficult. DNA testing gives can give you another piece of information. Um, uh, so it has this particular meaning in uh, Jewish genealogy journals, uh, for example, where researchers are dealing with this uh, breakage that happened, not just with the Holocaust, but with all of those uh, pogroms and things that happened before and all those shifting boundaries in Eastern Europe. 
Um, there's a lot of very active use and discussion in Jewish genealogy communities about uh, uses of DNA. Um, obviously, uh, African Americans too, and those are the main groups I talk about in the book. But it is a really complicated question, Karen, because there are all these other uses of DNA testing uh, that have an older history. Like um, there's a great new book by Nara Milanich called Paternity. Mm-hmm. All the history is a great book. Paternity. Yeah, in American culture. And toward the end, um, she uh, reminds us of all of the cultural importance attached to paternity DNA testing. So there's this type of DNA testing that's much older than the stuff that's marketed on nasty genealogists that's done among close family members. And that kind of testing also has a really a- active uses and active meanings for modern day genealogy communities. When you read about sort of law enforcement the other year, uh, I believe it was the Golden State Killer tracked down through specific postings that relative that re- remote relatives had made on genealogy websites and the kind of DNA testing that happens among close relatives to say that someone has a biological related to or not. So that kind of genealogy testing has also carried forward, where it's uh, sort of among individuals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There, um, I wanted to uh, just ask you to talk a little bit about some of the ethics of genealogy online because you alluded to the way that online communities can create, um, you know, people can create open family trees, which other people can see and people can make assertions about family connections. Um, and there are all kinds of, collab- you know, really potent collaborations that take place online. If you've been on any of the online genealogy listservs, you can see all these incredible research connections that are being made. Um, I think that some of those among um, uh, descendants of enslaved people are particularly um, significant, like the collaboration there, the collaborative um, potential is is particularly potent. Um, But then there are also these other ethical questions around people volunteering their DNA and family associations becoming known, for example, to law enforcement. And the yes. famous case you raised yes. of the Golden State Killer being identified because DNA was contributed by one of his second cousins or first cousins, I can't remember, to one of the commercial yeah, sites. And there are actually, there are now, there are real concerns about, about privacy issues here with some of this. Am I right? Absolutely. Uh, ancestry itself, uh, even in the months, uh, the final few months that I was um, uh, doing copy editing of the manuscript is vastly expanding. It's, uh, I would say, attentiveness and policies on privacy. And there's a great uh, cultural studies co- scholar who writes all about Ancestry.com and privacy. I want to draw everyone's attention to the work of Julia Crete in Canada, C-R-E-E-T. Uh, on on this very very matter and and of course uh, you and I also have to set this down this broader history of privacy relative to social media of all kinds for a long time uh, ancestry which began as a way to enable massive access uh, and one stop shopping, if you will, for genealogists to access documents of all kinds. Um, Now uh, it has also tried to uh, enable the kind of communicating and sharing that people do in other kinds of social media. And I think this is a really uh, open discussion. We're in the middle of this history and it'll be really interesting to see where we are in five or 10 years in terms of awareness of privacy. But in the meantime, um, if if you yourself are concerned about uh, privacy, uh, please, um, you know, be aware of uh, what you're you're posting in terms of genealogy. But oh dear, I don't want to suppress this tendency. I really admire in the history of genealogy, and I want to stress is all the sharing that mm-hmm. people do to save mm-hmm. the to prevent duplicating labor, but to further along their own research. Yeah, mm-hmm. we just got a five minute warning, and I believe there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I was going to ask, I'm going to save one of those for the very, very end. Um, okay. But I, but I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask you um, if there's anything you can say about what you see as the difference between kind of geneal- genealogical research that was happening in the 20th century and genealogical research that's happening now and right. the way that people are exploring family histories online. Right. Um, okay. Well, the scale has changed. The yeah. access has changed. Uh, you and I and everyone listening to us can do their genealogical research from home or from where we choose. 
Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of those broader social developments that I talked about for the 20th century are still there now. And I'm afraid, well, I kind of end on a down note because I worry uh, with the DNA testing, which itself is expressive of the importance that Americans attribute to biological relatedness and blood relationships, another irony we were concerned the whole premise of the American Revolution, right? It's this heredity, heredity, hereditary thinking being reinscribed when we talk mm -hmm. about the um, non-scientific understanding of DNA and everything, mm -hmm. everything that knowledge from DNA testing can do to seal mm -hmm. Uh, relatedness. Um, I'm afraid we're looking at uh, uh, DNA is this sort of bodily characteristic and you can get it, your DNA interpreted and read in all these ways. And Ancestry will even reinterpret a DNA test that you've already had uh, in, in many ways. So once I, you, you could say once your DNA is read, that itself is a dynamic process. However, I worry that we're still reinscribing these social differences. But a thing that makes me optimistic is um, all of these non-textual types of research are expanding um, access to geneal genealogical knowledge for groups in society who really fell on the wrong side of the all the advantages that would let you get to documentation. So documentation itself it's, it's expressive of a set of privileges. And I feel like the combination of documents and DNA are moving the field, fields like African-American genealogy and Jewish genealogy and um, uh, you name it, uh, Hispanic genealogy, sorry, Latinx genealogy, um, all sorts of fields forward that used mm -hmm. to be very difficult because of the shortage of documentation. So I and think, you, go ahead. I was going to say one of the problems with some of the DNA testing, of course, is that they're simply reading your individual test against whatever the collection yes. is that they have, right? So if yes. they only have a collection that is dominated by X or Y, then they're going to only understand your test vis-a-vis -vis that X and Y. They're not reading your test that's as correct. against the entire world. They're only no, they reading. Can't. So that's a, that's pretty important to understand, it's like why you're talking about how this. Yeah, that's right, yeah. and that's real. As I understand, that's proprietary company knowledge. Just how many people are right. in the sample that your DNA is being compared to, and right. um, who they are, and yeah. where yeah. they get them. So yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're so right. Uh, like any evidence, uh, DNA evidence has to be used very sparingly. Right, uh, right. Or just with a big grain of salt. Uh, so, uh, so one question that came in um, over, the, over the transom is a question about your title and whether your title, A Nation of Descendants, was influenced by John Kennedy's book, A Nation of Immigrants. And yes, whether that's... He, gave me, he gave me the idea. <laughs> He absolutely okay. gave me the idea, uh, uh, the title alone. Um, I don't claim to engage his thesis otherwise, although obviously that roots moment that I talked about is a huge mm -hmm. one for communities mm -hmm. of um, recent immigrants and for uh, ideas about ethnic diversity as a positive good in the United States. So you could say that. Um, I wanted to, I, I used a, a nation of descendants as my title because I wanted to just start with this very basic characteristic of genealogy in the United States, all the ways that it communicates the needs and priorities of descendants mm -hmm. and the needs and the priorities of uh, the present day in whatever time period you're doing your uh, genealogy in. Wonderful. Well, Francesca, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. It's been really rich and revealing and I'm hoping that lots of people are gonna go out and look for the book. Um, and again, I think we want to thank the National Archives and the Archivist for hosting this conversation. Same here. Thank you from me. And I, I have all sorts of histories of archives and libraries also in my book. So um, you all are heroes. So thanks from me. <laughs>